everyone, and welcome to the ninth episode of Assets Anonymous, your 12-step podcast to get grounded in reliability basics and create a culture of continuous improvement with your team. I'm your host, Tom Wilkes, Chief Editor of Plant Services, and I'm pleased to be joined today with George Williams and Joe Anderson of Reliability X, which aims to bridge the gap between operations and maintenance through holistic reliability focused on plant performance. Guys, welcome back for episode nine. Thanks for having us, Thomas. You know, in the last episode, we talked about what do I own and how critical is it, which is sort of the foundation of uh, criticality analysis and sorting out um, assets that run to fail from assets which should, which more care should be taken. And this episode is going to cover if they're critical, how does it fail? Um, and we talked a little bit before we start recording about what this might mean. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the ones that do run to fail and then focus on the strategy you have to have in place. Uh, for the ones you've, that you've identified as critical. Um, so yeah, can you start by talking about a little bit about that run to fail aspect, the strategy behind those, where about how many get to get to run to fail, in your opinion? Well, I mean, it depends on the output of that criticality analysis, but typically speaking, somewhere between 20 and 25% of your assets end up being just not really critical to the business. Uh, and that doesn't always mean the strategy there will be run to fail. In some cases, the replacement cost of that piece of equipment still may be substantial, even though there's not really a, it's not really providing significant business value. And so maybe you do some PM. Um, but there also may be assets where, you know, they do supply some value to the business but they're not really practical to work on and you're just going to swap them out and call them spare parts. And so hmm. even though by definition, they may have been an asset because of some regulatory nature, um, you're just going to toss them and, and replace them. Right. So maybe you have a backflow preventer that you track in the system as an asset because you have to do the testing, mm-hmm. um, but realistically there's no preventive maintenance. You're just proving out the test, right. That, that, the, the states requiring or whatever. So there are assets that fall kind of in all that stuff, but most generally speaking run to failure is because it's just not worth it. It's not worth the time, effort and cost to have a preventive maintenance strategy. Yeah. You you have a liability piece too, where you'll be doing some maintenance because of insurance or something. Right. And it's still run to failure. So, um, but you have to do your IR scans. You've got to do some of that type of stuff. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're still basically run to failure. Um, although you're doing a few tests related to it based on some other requirement. Okay. Well, and let's say you've got your criticality list. Um, you've built <clears throat> the criteria for what is and isn't critical using your cross-functional team, as we talked about in episode eight. And the team signed off on it. And Joe, as you mentioned, sometimes you got a piece of paper that everyone does sign at the end of the process to say, yes, we agree. These are the criteria, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the next step Um, when it comes to building that strategy? That that really is what this episode of the podcast is all about. Um, Understanding the failure modes of the critical assets. Well, typically, like I said, with the rule of thumb, they say about the top 20% of your assets are the most critical. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that varies, but um, that would drive either the need for FMEA or an RCM analysis, depending on the company and that those types of things. But um, using those tools to determine um, the most robust maintenance strategy that you could possibly have. Right. And, and where people get into situations is they could not be doing any PDM technology at the mm-hmm. time. And so for detectability and for um, some of those other things, uh, the use of PDM technologies will be required to have the most robust strategy you could possibly have to understanding that asset's health. And so there's this dilemma that comes up that says, well, you know, if we use certain technologies, we can mitigate a lot of the risk, you know? Um, So that's kind of a watch out, I guess you could say, um, as you're determining your maintenance strategy. Um, But yeah, it's definitely, typically you're going to do FMEA. (laughs) 
or RCM to determine the maintenance strategy. At this point, when it's critical, you're trying to understand, and, and the title of our, our episode here, you know, how does it fail? We're trying to understand exactly how it fails, whether you use those formalized approaches uh, and call them failure modes or whatever the case may be. It, we're trying to understand in what ways, what component failures um, and what will cause failure of this asset that I have to make sure I mitigate. Again, it's all about risk mitigation. So which of those failure modes are likely to occur? Um, and even these scenarios are not perfect. Um, and I'm going to probably get lots of feedback on this, but when you do an FMEA or an RCM, you're getting down to those component levels and deciding what the failure modes are and assessing those failure modes and then coming up with a risk priority number and all that fun stuff that you follow in the process. I, we've had a failure that, that, you know, we, we tried to convince a manager of a plant that they needed training in how to properly torque and use precision tools. And there was a pump whose electrical connections were on a ceramic block for the motor. Mm -hmm. And they almost lit this thing on fire because the ceramic block was cracked because they over tightened mm -hmm. it. Right, when no PM, no FMEA, it unlikely that the ceramic block terminal connection being over tightened and causing the crack, which eventually creates an arc and heat and melts all my insulation and creates a fire is being identified in the FMEA. So it's not only the formal process, it has to be what happens in the field feeding back into that system. And so your failure modes have to be a living entity that include not only what you brainstorm in a room and hopefully you have all the right people and identify a bunch of stuff, but it's unrealistic to think you will, you will identify 100% of the potential failure modes when you sit in a room and do this exercise. And I think that's a, uh, you know, if anybody does believe that it's probably foolish, I, you know, the probability is slim and none. And so you, it has to be a living list of failure modes that are recurringly looked at and that your CMMS feeds back. And in a previous episode, you asked about, you know, what's the value of the CMMS piece. Mm -hmm. This is it right here, because in a filing cabinet, finding all the failures and identifying what failure modes you have a strategy against and which ones are new is not an easy task in a CMMS. It should be an easy task if you've set it up properly. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the other variable with the robust maintenance strategy is how knowledgeable are your people? <laughs> you could have a lot of green guys and you bring in a great facilitator. They sit down and they start probing, trying to understand failure modes and people are just deer in the headlight. Mm. because they don't understand this stuff and mm -hmm. so th that's part of the dilemma as well especially when you've always been 100 percent reactive and you don't know any better you get a bunch of people in the room and they don't know either and then depending on the facilitator <laughs> right so th there's a lot of weaknesses in using a formal process um to develop the, because it requires at least a general level of knowledge and some understanding of the process. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what I love about this conversation is, is that it's not about what's the process of FMEA or RCM. So when we think about episodes uh, 10 and 11, we're talking about what will maintenance do about fire modes and what will operations do about fire modes. When you conduct an FMEA, you draw a box around the asset. And you basically say, okay, utilities are there, raw materials are coming the way they're supposed to, but that's not the reality of life. The reality of life is supply chain decided to save a penny and bought cheaper car again. And now it's causing box jams and you've, it'll never be identified as a failure mode. And so no one is going to address it until it's a nightmare at the line, hopefully. But in, in not being rigid, in being more fluid, that gets identified as a failure mode and an operational standard and a receipt inspection gets put in place because you have a more fluid, holistic approach to reliability mm -hmm. versus the rigid, well, you must draw a box around the asset and assume all this stuff is here. And But that's not the way life is. You, you don't have perfection coming into your asset on a regular basis. 
And so the question becomes, if if the raw material is not right, right, the asset, if you define it from a reliability perspective is, you know, reliability is is basically machine, I mean, uh, mission success, right? So performing a stated function over a stated period of time uh, under stated conditions. But if those conditions are, are, you know, the target must be perfect and that's not what happens. Did the equipment fail? The equipment didn't fail. The, okay. There's no failure of the equipment. The process mm-hmm. failed. But more broadly, are we now operating unreliably? The answer to that question is yes. And so, you know, when we talk about failure modes being a living entity, it far exceeds past the machine itself or the assets inherent reliability and failure mode. Because in order, our job as reliability is to derive value from an asset. Mm -hmm. It's not to make it perfect in terms of its maintenance. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference there. And when, you know, Mm -hmm. we're in an episode like this, that for me, that's more interesting to explore than how to identify a failure mode. Mm, right. Especially given that equipment related failures are very minimal. Typically it's always some outside circumstance that causes the machine to go down. Joe, I think one of it's people. <laughs> I guess one of our first conversations, I want to say going back to 2015, mm-hmm. Joe was when you told the story about how uh, a vendor had brought in a different kind of set screw for a bearing. Yeah, and, bearing failures. Yeah, and no one had noticed the set screw change uh, because uh, the assumption was that the the the, the set screws coming in from as inventory would be the right ones, yeah. and that your team had traced that back down to a, a change in set screw, which really impacted bearing performance. It wasn't the bearing itself. Yeah, we were wow. used to using cups, right? So on the set screw, you have different tips, and they have different functions. And we typically used a uh, cupped end, and that's what we required um, to lock down our bearings. And this, they brought in a new guy. We had a, it was vendor managed on the back end. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I won't mention the name. <laughs> we eventually <laughs> got rid of them out of the plant. But um, he just started going, okay, it's a quarter 20 set screw and dumping everything every type of set screw known to man in there just to make sure that the, that bin was full. Mm -hmm. And my guys are just grabbing set screws, not paying attention. So there was an awareness piece on our end that we were at fault for, Mm -hmm. um, that required me to bring some attention to the education of my folks on set screws, but they were just grabbing them and and putting them in and, and they kept backing out. And then, uh, you know, the bearings riding on the shaft and eating out the shaft and all this stuff. And it came back that uh, it was a set screw failure. And right. uh, those are those are failure modes, again, that you don't plan for. That's It's a human-induced error. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we don't look at the human inducing of defects into the system to address failure modes. We just go... Piece of equipment, motor, bearing, over lubrication, under lubrication, right? And um, it's very robotic <laughs> and very uh, textbook. And mm-hmm. and those typically, typically, now they can be, but typically aren't the main failure modes that crash your machine all the time. And right. in, in, in defense of those approaches, you know, how many human induced errors will you list? Like who knows, right. but, you know, yeah. but somebody takes a crap on a conveyor belt. Somebody like there's a thousand <laughs> things that could be identified. Right. Right. It's just millions. It, it's just endless. Right. The sabotage yeah. that you could list as a failure mode. Yeah. There's but so- sporadic versus chronic issues are completely different. Right. Yeah. If I crap on the conveyor belt, that's a sporadic one off thing. Unless the dude's a habitual crapper, then you, <laughs> you got an issue. Right. Um, but a lot of these are the same mistakes being made over and over and over again. Right. And those are the ones that become the main drivers. They're the main causes behind the machine failures. All your minor stops. Corrugate mm-hmm. is a good one. The fight with corrugate and just about every food manufacturing plant you can think of, there's a fight between operations, maintenance, quality, and supply chain over the quality of the corrugate that they get in or it not being within specification. Mm-hmm. 
but I don't think I've ever really seen that in an FMEA, although it's very common. You'll have it in a processed FMEA. It'll say, box jam, shut the machine down. You will. And that's the response, <laughs> right? Like, like identify the box jam, shut the machine down. That's shut that. the machine down. Yeah. The, the... So the engineers who design the line, they don't identify, well, is it in spec or out of spec? Because the, the, the theory behind the FMEA says draw the box and everything coming in is there and, and in the right quantity and all that stuff. Even when you read the RCM um, standard, it tells you all those things. Everything is present in the right quantity and right quality. But that's not the reality of life. And so we have to identify, we have to have a living failure mode library that includes what actually happens at the plant floor level. So, you know, we're not knocking those approaches. They're going to identify the physical entity failures associated with the equipment. For sure. Uh, what they're not going to do is identify the, the reality of life of what happens when you have to operate the equipment. Like, it, you know, a, an FMEA on the car isn't going to identify that the user put in diesel in their gasoline engine, right? So, mm, mm -hmm. Which, for the record, that's my favorite kind of mistake on the Amazing Race TV show. Uh, in the early seasons, that happened all Well, when the you time. get an American to fly anywhere outside of America, <laughs> the first thing they do is throw, you know, put the wrong fuel in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were teams driving through a desert, and I'd say half the teams put diesel in the car and didn't take a look at the labels in the car and just assumed that any gas was good gas. Yeah. Um, uh, let me ask you this question then, too. I mean, I, George and Joe both, I liked how you're tying this into the notion of continuous improvement, which really, in the end, is kind of what this whole series of podcasts is driving towards, which is getting one of the key parts of getting out of reactive is to stop thinking of things as non-continuous, as isolated, that you're all, once you engage in reliability, uh, it is this continuous journey. Uh, might be a pause here and there, but the, the library you're talking about building here in failure modes, it's a living library. It's got to be. And, mm -hmm. and people have to record things that it sounds like they might not otherwise have considered recording, but you know, honestly, when it comes to people interacting, interacting with the machines, there's infinite ways to do it. So you try and figure out which are those ways that are adding uh, uh, flaws and failures to the machine. Well, I think the biggest mistake you can make, especially as a maintenance manager, is completing a criticality analysis and going, yeah, I made it. Acting like you never have to go back and revisit it again. Yeah, check the box. Yeah. You know, it's right. uh, and uh, you know, it's just one of those things that seems to happen quite a bit. They'll even do FMEA, do do all the stuff, but 20 minutes after completing it, the business need changes, which completely upsets everything you just spend all this time doing, but we never go back and, and revisit it. And now another line has all the volume and another line is the driver behind the business. And uh, yeah, the we thing deal is, with that a lot in, in pharmaceuticals because product has a expected you know, it, it, your patent exclusivity pans out in 17 years and it takes you seven to 10 to, to even get, you know, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So you buy these assets with 20 year lives and seven year expectations of use. Mm -hmm. And so consistently you're shifting your focus to the newer lines and the lines where the volume has cut to 25 to 50% because you lost patent exclusivity should you still be using predictive technologies on those lines? Well, I mean, it depends on the value that they bring and but some lines are just going to shut down. They just, they're mothballed. They're running the failure till the next line comes in. And um, you have to continually update that strategy accordingly. And, and to Joe's point, that happens not just in pharma, that, that happens all <laughs> over the place. Um, and so you have to be able to shift your focus to what's important. Again, all of this boils down to risk identification and risk mitigation. Hmm. Let me ask you a question about online asset failure mode libraries, because, you know, that that's part of what the digital age has brought us in the ability uh, for plant teams and especially vendors to share knowledge about the assets. Um, you know, that's I, I'm guessing this is part of this process of building the failure mode library. We talked a lot about the ones that were unpredictable on the mechanical side, you know, the human errors. Um, what's the role? that you think, you know, especially vendors have to play going forward, vendors who collect data on their digital machines and understand where the failure modes might be. So being a vendor, that's a double-edged sword, but I'll take a stab at just saying, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it, 
they've done a lot of this work. I think it's a crime when they come in and pretend they have to do this from scratch and they write failure modes for a pump with a client Mm -hmm. um, when they've probably done it for 50 different clients by that point. And so they already know the failure modes of a pump. Mm -hmm. They should just be reviewing it and seeing if there's anything unique about the design of the pump they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, But instead they start from scratch and go through the exercise. Um, I like to think we're not an organization that, that, that works out that operates like that and and maybe right. others don't but you're also seeing things like online subscription stuff and you know you can buy my failure code library for x i think they're all great starting points if you have nothing then something is better than nothing mm-hmm. um, and then going through those and identifying what's different about you the context of your asset um, is is certainly a time-saving exercise uh, and i i think that adds value uh, by at this point in time though we should have a massive failure mode library everywhere mm-hmm. um, and everybody should have access to it should pretty much just be free <laughs> <laughs> yeah the watch out for me is i've bought one before by a very reputable company in an access database and it was blank and so i'm that that pissed me off because then it was they wanted to facilitate some exercises with me and start building it. The mm-hmm. way that they sold it to me was the assumption that there's all these failure modes in here for all these pieces of equipment. Mm-hmm. And I paid 10 grand for this thing. Mm-hmm. And it was a blank access database, which on the back end, I think they had all the failure modes, but it was hidden through password protection and all that stuff. But they wanted me to take time to fill out some information to give me certain failure modes. Oh, you want you want access to the data? That's an and that was not the assumption that I had when I paid for it. <laughs> right. And so, right. You, yeah, I know it was like, right. man, I was so mad. I, I lost so much respect for this company, and um, because the way you're selling it versus the way everything else went down. Um, and to me, I'm a loyal guy. So once you ding me, it's very hard to recover my trust, hmm. um, which is a shortcoming of my own, but. You know, it's like, I won't do business with you anymore and I won't recommend you to anyone, mm-hmm. you know, and it was Fire horrible. Yeah, yeah. You just, you got to be careful because you have this idea of what you think you're getting versus actuality mm-hmm. when you go to purchase some of those things. So just be aware of that. Yeah. Not to say that everybody does that. I haven't mm-hmm. really seen anyone that really has one um outside of this one company so okay um but i'm sure they're out there yeah Yeah, there are i i I do know other companies that have like an online database but they're not really selling it like here by the database they 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 just use it on the back end on the back side of things as they facilitate the next fmea and um But I think, you know, if you are going to vet those things out, things to be aware of are the level of detail that you need versus the level of detail that that particular failure mode library is going to. Because uh, you can drill down way into component level failure modes, right? Like how does the bearing fail? What causes an inner race defect or an outer race defect or a, a cage failure mm-hmm. versus um, pump bearing failure and then stop there. Do you need the next layer down? I guess that depends on your business and the critical nature of that bearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what should be driving that. But if you don't, then, you know, you're not looking for a library that's going down to that level of detail. And if you do, then you want to vet that library to make sure it is giving you that level of detail. Okay. Well, one final question then. And I was going to ask at one point, how long does this take? But I think that's the wrong question. And my my question really is, would I be (laughs) right in assuming that the question really should be once you start, when can I stop? And the answer is really never. It's continuous, right? Right. I mean, there there is- comes a point where you have to have something developed for all your assets. So that is one. You continue to improve it. And like I said, the business needs change and stuff. So you've got to constantly be on top of it. Um, but if you have nothing, you know, the first goal is figuring out again what's critical but then take one asset at a time Mm. take the one that's been identified as the most critical and just say hey we need to you know 
have a robust strategy that can mitigate some of these failure modes and then, you know, go out and execute on it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't have time or resources or whatever, especially given the circumstances we're in today where it seems no one wants to work. And Mm -hmm. so you're short, you know, you're short 32 people, um, in a facility of a hundred, how are you going to create that strategy? Right. How do you have time and resources? So, and it is extensive. It, 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 it's, this is not a minor amount of work. No. To get the, the proper maintenance strategy in place is not a minor amount of work. Right. Um, and there are, you know, approaches that can help streamline, that can get you, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it or accuracy, 80% of the value for 20% of the effort, right? You can, you can look at centrifugal pumps Mm-hmm. And identify all the failure modes, and then from a context perspective, see what applies to your most critical pumps and what doesn't apply, and what failure modes you want to address and not address, and not necessarily get into all the weeds of individualized components down to make and model of every pump. And that can help reduce significantly the amount of time and effort that you put into this. And there's lots of different approaches there's RCM, RCM2, RCM Blitz, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And there's like 50 different ways that you can slice this up and either gain some efficiency in lieu of value, but there's always a trade off. So the faster you're going to go through this process, the less, you know, you should expect from a quality perspective, but do you need it to that level of detail really is the question and um, finding that, that proper thing. Um, Yeah. And and I think there's other like thoughts, just kind of tips for people to be aware of also would include things like, um, you know, you, you can save some time by doing this in context and by asset class and then criticality of that asset because criticality should have vetted the value Mm -hmm. already, um, at least generally speaking. And so instead of maybe getting way down into individualized RPNs, let's do this once for a pump, ignore RPN in terms of severity um, and try to focus on detectability and occurrence. Um, And then look across all of my pumps, which ones should, you know, what's different, insert my severity scores and then output my, my RPNs. What's the highest RPNs and what do I have to do? Which is our next, uh, our next podcast is what are we going to do about it? Right. But you could do, you could take uh, your top 50 components and do that. Right. Everyone has a gearbox. Everyone has a motor. Everyone has a pump. Everyone has a bearing every. So there's, these commonalities between even in the industry, right? They all have those components. Um, And so like George said, you know, you just take the top failure modes for most of those components and, and you can assess whether they apply to everything else across your asset base. Mm. And so really you're only doing, you know, 50 pieces of equipment or 50 components. Mm-hmm. I just want to Versus say for all of the, I just want to say really quick for all of the RCM purists out there, please drive safely while listening to this portion of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure your OnStar is working. They are banging the steering wheel and screaming, but the reality is the reality. You can get value without going to that level of detail. I didn't need it in the food industry. And this is where people get irritated, right? Because the purists are good. They're in oil and gas, they're in chemical processing and in these very intensive risk, intensive um, industries and food. I just needed to know, okay, I don't need to over lubricate the bearing. Got it. Like I didn't need a whole lot of detail in there because the consequence of the business wasn't nearly as severe as it would be in a different industry. So it wasn't a big deal to me you know right i never did i never did rcm i wouldn't ever do an rcm in a food plant (laughs) i just wouldn't do it (laughs) you know there's it's not worth the time and the value unless they cut a po then then well even (laughs) then you're basically doing a bastardized version right 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 fmea so but that goes back to your point which is when it comes to this kind of effort it's going to be a boatload of effort make sure you know which of your which of your work is going to add value to extracting value from the asset. 
to go back to your per first point, George. This, is, this isn't about making sure the asset never breaks or never dies. It's about extracting the value you want in, uh, of these assets and knowing which ones are most critical to your operation. Right. So. That's our job. Well, all right. Um, we've alluded to the next podcast in the series a couple of times this time. So join us next time for what will maintenance do about it um, for episode nine. Um, Tom, thanks, Joe and George, for being here today. Thanks, awesome. thanks for having us. Tom.